Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the leader of the Order of the Ivory Towers, the Archmandrite. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. The Archmandrite is a 0-5 human advisor that costs 2, a blue, a red, and a white that has the following abilities. Her first ability has us, at the beginning of our upkeep, gain X life, where X is equal to the number of cards we have in hand, minus 4. Her second ability, whenever we gain life, grants each advisor, artificer, and monk we control vigilance and plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is equal to the amount of life we gained. And her third and final ability lets us tap 3 untapped advisors, artificers, and or monks we control to draw a card. Breaking down her core stats, the Archmandrite is sporting a mid-weight CMC, a very low power stat block for her cost, and a series of abilities that merge life gain and a combined tribe of advisors, artificers, and monks to turn them into offensive powerhouses and sources of card advantage. Beginning with her first ability, it's simply the Artifact Ivory Tower built into our commander, which provides some serviceable passive life gain provided we're able to keep our hand count high, which thanks to our commander's built-in draw and access to blue should usually not be a problem. This then leads nicely into her second ability, which takes that life gain and turns it into a powerful AoE buff for both herself and our mixed tribe members. And since this ability isn't limited to once per turn, it allows us to easily use other sources of life gain to pump up our board even further. While the AoE vigilance it provides allows us to keep the same creatures we powered up previously to protect us from the crackback. Still, since this is strictly a boost to our creature's power, unless our creatures have high base toughness like the Archmandrite herself, we'll want to be careful with our attacks since we'll definitely want to keep our tribe members around, primarily due to the Archmandrite's last ability, in which we can tap down said tribe members for card advantage. And since we can do this at any time, we can safely swing in with our pumped up tribe members on our turn after gaining life, leaving them up to block on our opponent's turns, then tap them down to draw before the turn gets back to us, which in turn gets us more cards in hand to gain more life, creating a nice little self-contained loop of damage output and value so long as we can sustain it. So, as we can see, the Archmandrite is a commander that takes two apparently unrelated mechanics, namely life gain and the multi-tribe of advisors, artificers, and monks, and combines them into a self-contained synergistic machine of damage output and value. Which is why, of course, we'll be taking this build in a life gain-focused direction, aiming to maximize our commander's ability to power up our tribe members, which will primarily consist of monks as they synergize the best with this playstyle. Monks, after all, have a fair number of members that provide life gain on their own, as well as plenty of members that benefit from us casting non-creature spells for additional value, which we'll be casting plenty of throughout the course of the game to gain us life and set up our boards. And to support this playstyle, we'll be running plenty of additional sources of life gain to pump up our monks even further, lots of ways to grant our monks evasion, first strike, or otherwise avoid damage as they swing in so their comparatively low toughness is a non-factor in combat, and plenty of ways to draw cards alongside our commander and remove our maximum hand size limit to make the life gain the Archmandrite provides as potent as possible. So let's turn back the pages of Dominaria's history to the Brothers' War and the tragedy that was the fall of the Ivory Towers. Tiresia City was once a beacon of learning and enlightenment, and at its center was the Order of the Ivory Towers, bookkeepers and scholars that sought only to learn and teach magic for the betterment of Dominaria, with the Archmandrite being the best and brightest among them. She, along with Herkel, Drofna, and Felden, established the Third Path, an alliance of scholars, mages, and historians that would remain neutral in the war between Urza and Mishra and continue their studies in peace. It was, however, not meant to last, as they were betrayed by the Brotherhood of Gix, whom they accepted into their ranks as fellow scholars, allowing Mishra's forces, led by Ashnod, to breach the city. And while the Archmandrite and her fellow Order members would fight bravely until the end, inflicting devastating losses to the Falaji forces with their unrivaled magical prowess, the towers and the city would be razed to the ground, and the era of enlightenment they sought to bring to Dominaria would die with them, yet another victim of Urza and Mishra's senseless war. 
So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we have its lone entrant, Monastery Swift Spear, a 1-2 with haste and prowess. Making it a cheap body to drop before our commander to ensure we have the three tribe members required to get the Archmandrite's draw engine online, and then serving as a solid body to swing in with as we pump it via our life gain as well as when we cast our non-creature spells thanks to prowess. The CMC2 slot is then up next, its first half bringing us some life-gaining monks in the form of Lone Missionary, Oresco Sun Guide, and Soulfire Grandmaster. Lone Missionary is a 1-2 that, when it ETBs, gains us 4 life. It's usually innocuous life gain effect being very valuable to us when working alongside our commander to give its fellow tribe members a plus 4 power boost the turn it comes down, after which it can serve as another body for us to power up and swing in with and or draw cards for us. Oresco Sun Guide is a 2-2 that, whenever it becomes untapped, gains us 2 life, this time synergizing perfectly with our commander's ability to tap it down for draw, allowing us to get an extra board-wide plus 2 plus 0 in Vigilance when it untaps at the start of our turn with just it, our commander, and one other tribe member in play at no mana cost. Soulfire Grandmaster is another 2-2, this time with lifelink, that gives all instants and sorceries we control lifelink, and lets us pay 2 and 2 hybrid white red, 2, the next time we cast an instant or sorcery, to put that card into our hand instead of our graveyard as it resolves. Again, serving as a cheap tribal body to further our game plan, and whose activated ability will, in the mid to late game, allow us to keep our hand count high as we bounce our spells back to hand as we cast them. We then have a pair of blue entrants joining our ranks as we pass this slot's halfway mark with Elusive Spellfist and Jeskai Elder. Elusive Spellfist is a 1-3 that, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, gains plus 1 plus 0 and can't be blocked until the end of the turn, giving us another non-creature spell payoff whose evasion works very well with the power boost our commander provides to ensure its damage gets in reliably. Jeskai Elder is a 1-2 with prowess that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, lets us draw a card and then discard a card. Checking all the boxes for a good addition to our deck by being a tribe member, hitting the board early to enable our draw, and benefiting from the large number of non-creature spells we have, and that's on top of having some serviceable card selection to boot. And then closing out this slot, we have Third Path Iconoclast, a 2-1 that, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, creates a 1-1 artifact soldier creature token. It's non-creature spell payoff allowing us to build up our board state quite nicely and supplement our relatively low base creature count. It's then on to the CMC3 slot, which opens up with another trio of monks, those being Mantis Rider, Monastery Mentor, and Shu Yun the Silent Tempest. Mantis Rider is a 3-3 flyer with Vigilance and Haste. Its built-in keywords allowing it to put the power boost it receives from our commander to good use by swinging in immediately and bypassing blockers as soon as it comes down to really pile on the damage. Monastery Mentor is a 2-2 with Prowess that, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, creates a 1-1 monk creature token with Prowess making it a superb addition to the build that not only builds up our board state as we cast our spells, but does so with tribe members that will also benefit from our commander's AoE pump and can be used as repeatable card advantage as well. Shu Yun is a 2-3 with prowess that, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, lets us pay 2 hybrid red-white to grant target creature double strike until end of turn, combining our high volume of non-creature spells and our commander's AoE power boost into a way to cheaply empower our creatures to more likely survive combat if blocked, or deal double damage if they get through thanks to his double strike granting, either of which we're fine with. Runetail Katsune Ascendant then also joins us as another monk entrant, being a 2-2 that, if we have 30 or more life, flips into Runetail's Essence, an enchantment that prevents all damage that would be dealt to creatures we control, usually flipping to its enchantment side as soon as it comes down thanks to us starting at 40 life, and on its own making our creatures low base toughness irrelevant, allowing us to swing in with our powered up creatures with impunity without fear of losing them to blockers. We then wrap up this slot with a pair of non-monk tribe members, those being Mirror Entity and Hercule Master Wizard. Mirror Entity is a 1-1 with Changeling that lets us pay X to, until end of turn, make all creatures we control base power XX and gain all creature types. It's built-in Changeling, making it an honorary tribe member and its AoE stat manipulation working very well to improve our creatures' damage output and survivability in combat. 
Urkel is a 2-4 human wizard advisor that, at the beginning of our end step if we cast a non-creature spell that turn, reveals the top 5 cards from our deck, allowing us to put one of each non-creature card type revealed this way into our hand if we cast that spell type that turn and sending the rest to the bottom of our deck in a random order. Still making her a tribe member thanks to being an advisor and serving as a passive way to dig for additional instants, artifacts, and occasionally enchantments as we cast them at no mana cost, which goes a long way to keep our hands topped off for our commander's life gain. Now passing the halfway mark of our creature entries, the CMC4 slot brings us back to the Munka game plan with the white entrance, Ojatai Exemplars, Student of Ojatai, and Rock's Faith Mender. Ojitai Exemplars are a 4-4 that, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, let us choose one of the following effects. Tap target creature, have Ojitai Exemplars gain first strike and lifelink until end of turn, or exile Ojitai Exemplars, then return them back to the battlefield under their owner's control. Again, serving as a decent payoff as we cast our non-creature spells to either tap down blockers, making itself difficult to block while padding our life totals, or even protecting itself from removal as needed. Student of Ojitai is a 2-4 that, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, gains us 2 life, making it a straightforward source of life gain that we'll be getting lots of mileage out of throughout the course of the game to provide that extra bit of pump almost every turn and sometimes multiple times per turn. Rock's Faith Mender is a 1-5 with lifelink that, if we would gain life, has us gain twice that much life instead, on its own doubling every single one of our life gain sources to make our commander's AoE tribal pump twice as effective, while also possessing a very solid toughness which allows it to swing in reliably after the pump even if we have no other ways to provide it with evasion or damage mitigation. It's then on to a pair of legendary monks as we move deeper into this slot with OG Exquisite Blade and Taigam Ojitai Master. OG is a 2-3 that, when they ETB, scries 2 and gains us 2 life, in addition to, whenever we cast our second spell each turn, they exile up to one target creature we control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control, making them a decent source of repeatable life gain and card selection as they flicker themselves, while occasionally serving as a way to protect our other creatures from targeted removal if we have 2 spells to cast on our opponent's turns. Tigum is a 3-4 that prevents instant sorceries and dragon spells from being countered, in addition to, if Tigum attacked that turn, giving any instant or sorcery we cast that turn a rebound. His ability to prevent our opponents from interacting with our instants and sorceries, as well as allowing us to effectively recast them for free on the following turn, allowing us to get a lot more mileage out of a good chunk of our non-creature spells. Mistfire Adept then gets added in as another monk entrant in this slot, being a 3-3 with prowess that, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, grants target creature flying until end of turn, providing both itself and all its brethren with easy to enable evasion to more easily bypass blockers and get in for damage with their pumped up power. And lastly, we have the legendary non-monk Denry Kill Nenitor in chief wrapping up this slot, being a 2-2 cat advisor that ETBs with our choice of a plus one plus one first striker vigilance counter, and whenever a non-token creature ETBs under our control, if Denry has counters, puts the same kind and number of counters on that creature, who nine times out of ten will be selecting to put a first strike counter on to then distribute that counter to all our other tribe members as they come into play, giving us yet another way to get maximum value out of our creature's high power and low toughness in combat. Just about reaching the end now, the CMC 5 slot is up next with its three monk entrants, Dragon Style Twins, Githrazi Monk, and Elsha of the Infinite. Dragon Style Twins are a 3-3 with double strike and prowess, making them ideal targets to pump with our commander to survive combat if blocked, or if they don't get blocked or are granted evasion, allowing them to crack in for some serious damage. Githrazi Monk is a 3-2 with flash and flying that, when it ETBs, taps all creatures we don't control, easily allowing us to bring down our opponent's defenses the instant it comes down to enable devastating alpha strikes, and its built-in flash allowing us to do so on our opponent's turns to catch them completely off guard. Elsha of the Infinite is a 3-3 with prowess that lets us look at the top card of our deck at any time, and cast non-creature non-land cards off the top of our deck at flash speed, her non-creature sight not only allowing us to generate card advantage from our top deck, but also allowing us to play those cards at instant speed for even more flexibility, all while powering herself up and proccing all our other non-creature spell payoffs. 
And finally, reaching the CMC 6 slot and our final creature, we have Narset Enlightened Master. A 3-2 with First Strike and Hexproof that, whenever she attacks, exiles the top 4 cards of our deck, letting us cast any non-creature cards from among them without paying their mana costs. Her keywords making her a near-perfect tribe member to empower thanks to her combat survivability and targeted removal protection, and the free spells she provides as she swings in making her a great source of value as well. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have the removal spells Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares, both of which exile target creature, the former letting its controller put a basic land from their deck into play tapped, and the latter allowing its owner to gain life equal to its power. Both serving as excellent and inexpensive removal options to deal with problematic creatures, with the latter also being situationally useful to exile one of our own creatures for the life gain if we're pushing for lethal. The first half of the CMC2 slot then brings us a pair of counter spells in the form of counter spell and negate, both of which counter target spell, the former being able to counter anything and the latter being limited to non-creature spells, both of which provide excellent spell disruption to ensure our opponents either don't interfere with our game plans or are unable to move forward with their own. The second half of this slot then adds in a pair of damaging and healing spells into our arsenal with lightning helix and lantern flare. Lightning Helix has us deal 3 damage to any target and gains us 3 life, making it a simple but effective removal spell that also pumps our board by plus 3 plus 0 on the cheap. Lantern Flare has us deal X damage to target creature or planeswalker and gains us X life, where X is equal to the number of creatures we control. Or alternatively, we can cast it for its cleave cost of X a red and a white to have us deal X damage to target creature or planeswalker and gain X life instead. Serving as a slightly more limited copy of Lightning Helix that can't hit face but can hit harder depending on our board state or if we pump mana into it, which again is great for pumping up our board and getting rid of blockers. The removal game plan then continues into the CMC3 slot with its first two entrants, Generous Gift and Chaos Warp, both of which target a permanent, the former destroying it and giving its owner a 3-3 to replace it, and the latter shuffling it back into its owner's deck and then having them reveal the top card from it, allowing them to put it into play if it's a permanent, making them both very potent sources of spot removal that are quite capable of dealing with a wide variety of threats with relatively little downside. We'll also be adding in Jeskai Charm to our removal suite, which has us choose one of the following effects. Put target creature on top of its owner's library, deal 4 damage to target opponent or planeswalker, or grant all creatures we control plus 1 plus 1 in lifelink until end of turn, providing us with a very versatile spell that can help us either deal with creatures or walkers, or instead pump our board and pad our life totals depending on what we need at the time. The counter spell Absorb then wraps up our removal in this slot, which counters target spell and gains us 3 life, adding just a bit more spell disruption to the build with some life gain tacked on just in case our opponents want to disrupt us on our turn for a bit more damage when we swing in. And then we close out this slot with a pair of life gaining spells, namely Sphinx's Revelation and Union of the Third Path. Sphinx's Revelation is an X spell that has us draw X cards and gain X life, making it an ideal way to both keep our hands full for our commander's passive life gain later and providing immediate life gain to pump our board on the turn we cast it, all with the benefit of allowing us to scale it as little or as much as we need. Union of the Third Path has us draw a card and then gain life equal to the amount of cards we have in hand, usually gaining us 6-7 to seven life for a massive power boost to our board and, because it's an instant, allowing us to use it as a pseudo combat trick to get our opponents out of nowhere after blockers are declared. Closing in on the end now, the CMC4 slot brings us our penultimate instant entry, Ojatai's Command, which has us choose two of the following effects, return target creature of CMC2 or less from our grave to the battlefield, gain 4 life, counter target creature spell, and or draw a card, each mode being very serviceable in this build to either help us reanimate our smaller tribe members, pump our board via life gain, or disrupt our opponent's summoning, all with the option to turn it into a cantrip if we want to. And lastly, skipping to the CMC6 slot, we come to our final instant, Flying Crane Technique, which untaps all creatures we control and grants them flying and double strike until end of turn. The mass untapping it provides being somewhat useful to us to draw an extra card or two on our turn, but its main draw being the mass evasion and damage doubling it provides to bypass most blockers and help close out games in one fell swoop. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. 
It single slots all the way down in this category, skipping all the way to the CMC 5 slot to reach our first entry, Fell the Mighty, which destroys all creatures with power greater than target creature's power, making it a solid wipe for us to use alongside our creature's relatively low base power when our commander's not in play, or we're low on cards in hand to help us retake control of the board. Speaking of board wipes, the CMC 6 slot brings us another one in the form of Austere Command, which has us choose two of the following effects. Destroy all artifacts, destroy all enchantments, destroy all CMC 3 or less creatures, and or destroy all CMC 4 plus creatures. It's various different modes, making it a very flexible way to retake control of the board from a variety of different threat types and mitigating the damage it does to us as we do so. And lastly, the CMC7 slot brings us our third and final sorcery, Inspired Ultimatum, which has target player gain 5 life, deals 5 damage to any target, then draws us 5 cards. Its massive mana cost being well worth it thanks to the plus 5 power increase to our board alongside the Archmandrite, being able to deal with a blocker in the way of the impending attack, or getting some extra damage into our opponent's life before we swing, and even reloading our hands to ensure we have a full grip if we can't end the game on the spot. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Opening in the CMC1 slot of our enchantments, we have the classes Cleric Class and Wizard Class. Cleric Class, at level 1, whenever we would gain life, has us gain that amount of life plus 1 instead. At level 2, which costs 3 and a white, whenever we gain life, puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature we control. And at level 3, which costs 4 and a white, returns target creature from our graveyard back to the battlefield and has us gain life equal to its toughness. Its various life gain centric effects synergizing very well with our commander's passive life gain and our other life gain sources to improve said life gain, permanently grow our creatures as we gain life, and even providing a one-time reanimation effect with life gain attached if we need to return a tribe member back from the bin to fight again. Wizard class at level 1 removes our maximum hand size limit, at level 2 which costs 2 and a blue has us draw 2 cards, and at level 3 which costs 4 and a blue puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature we control whenever we draw a card. This time providing support to our commander's drawing ability as well as passive life gain by immediately allowing us to amass as many cards in hand as possible, generating additional card advantage to get even more cards in hand, and even eventually providing another way to permanently grow our creatures as we draw cards to increase our damage output alongside our life gain. Then skipping to the CMC3 slot, we have another pair of entries, those being Jeskai Ascendancy and Path of Bravery. Jeskai Ascendancy, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, has creatures we control gain plus one plus one until end of turn and untaps them, in addition to also letting us draw a card and discard a card whenever we cast a non-creature spell. Its untapping effect being massive to allow us to get additional card advantage from our commander while still being able to swing with our now bigger tribe members as we cast our non-creature spells, and the card selection it provides being a nice bit of upside to help us dig through our deck for more non-creature spells to generate even more value value and make our creatures even bigger. Path of Bravery, so long as our life total is greater than or equal to our starting life total, has creatures we control gain plus one plus one, and whenever one or more creatures we control attack, has us gain life equal to the number of attacking creatures. It's easy to enable Anthem providing a decent stat bump to our creatures, but its real draw being the on attack life gain it provides to further increase our tribe's power as they swing in for even more damage. It's then on to the CMC4 slot, which brings us yet another pair of entries in the form of Skywise Teachings and Whirlwind of Thought. Skywise Teachings, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, lets us pay one in a blue to create a 2-2 flying Jin monk creature token. Serving as a decent spell payoff that provides us with evasive tribe members as we cast our non-creature spells for a relatively low cost, which the Archmandrite can then put to good use by using them to generate card advantage and or powering them up so they can use their built-in evasion to reliably get in for damage. Whirlwind of Thought, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, draws us a card, making it a very simple but very powerful effect that turns the majority of our spells into cantrips, which goes a long way to keep our hand count high to further empower our commander's life gain, as well as letting us dig through our deck for more tribe members to grow our board, non-creature spells to proc our payoffs, and more life gain sources to further empower our tribe members. And finally, skipping to the CMC6 slot and reaching our final enchantment entry, we have True Conviction, which grants all creatures we control double strike and lifelink. 
capping off our enchantments with a powerful finisher that helps mitigate our creatures low toughness in combat, doubles their damage output, and gains us huge chunks of life back as we crack in for damage to help stabilize our life totals, which when paired with our naturally evasive creatures and our evasion granting sources can easily close out games for us the turn it comes down. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we open with the Ramp Source's Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble, the former tapping for two colorless and the latter letting us pay two, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, both providing us with dirt cheap ways to improve our mana base if drawn early and still being useful if drawn later to help us cheaply proc our non-creature spell payoffs for additional value. Ivory Tower then wraps up this slot, which, at the beginning of our upkeep, has us gain X life, where X is equal to the number of cards in our hand minus 4, literally serving as an additional copy of our commander's passive life gain effect to provide us with double the life gain and, as a result, to make our tribe members twice as powerful each turn, all for the bargain price of a single mana. Then proceeding to the CMC2 slot, we have our Mana Rock collection. Starting with Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Belwar Stone, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce, Azorius Signet, Boros Signet, and Izzet Signet, all of which we can pay one in tap to generate a combination of two of our colors, and a Talisman of Conviction, Talisman of Creativity, and Talisman of Progress, all of which either tap for a colorless or a combination of one of two of our colors instead if we take a damage all of which provide excellent ramp and fixing to help speed up our mana base while again cheaply proccing all our non-creature spell payoffs as they come down. We then close out the CMC2 slot with yet another mana rock, Thought Vessel, which we can tap for a colorless and removes our maximum hand size, again giving us another solid source of ramp, this time with the upside of also increasing the maximum life gain the Archmandroid can generate us per turn with her passive life gain, potentially increasing our tribe's damage output as well as our life totals considerably. In a similar vein, the CMC3 slot's only entrant, Decanter of Endless Water, also removes our maximum hand size limit and this time taps for a mana of any color, providing the same benefits as the previous entrant while also fixing our mana in the process. The CMC4 slot then brings us our penultimate artifact entry in the form of Well of Lost Dreams, which, whenever we gain life, lets us pay X, where X is less than or equal to the amount of life we gained to draw X cards, serving as a reliable way to turn our life gain into card advantage and ensure we can get even more life gain and bigger power increases on subsequent turns alongside our commander. And finally, reaching the CMC5 slot and our last artifact entry, we have Benser's Journal, which removes our maximum hand size limit and, on our upkeep, has us gain one life for each card in our hand, making it an improved version of our commander's first ability that turbochargers our life gain per turn, enabling our tribe members to hit exceptionally hard each turn without us even having to contribute a single mana. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. Our lone planeswalker joins us in the CMC4 slot, that being Jaya, Fiery Negotiator, who comes into play with 4 loyalty and has the following abilities. Her plus 1 creates a 1-1 one, one monk creature token with prowess. Her minus 1 exiles the top 2 cards of our deck, allowing us to play one of them until the end of the turn. Her minus 2 has its choose target creature and opponent controls, and, whenever we attack that turn, has her deal damage equal to the number of attacking creatures and her minus 8 creates an emblem that says, whenever we cast a red instant or sorcery, copy it twice and we may choose new targets for the copy, which will be primarily running for her first two abilities, as they help us most by either building up our board state with tribe members for the Archmandrite to empower and or use to generate value, or to let us dig through our deck for more resources with her impulse draw, though her minus 2 can be situationally useful to deal with blockers or other troublesome creatures if we have a wide enough board state. That covers our singular planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. Starting off with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity. Path of Ancestry, which comes into play tapped, taps for any color in our commander's color identity, and scries one if we use that mana to cast a creature whose type matches our commander's. Mystic Monastery, which comes into play tapped and taps for any of our colors. Exotic Orchard, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce. Battlefield Forge and Shivan Reef, both of which either tap for a colorless or instead a combination of one of two of our colors if we take a damage. Prairie Stream, which comes into play tapped unless we control 2 plus basic lands and taps for a white or blue, 
and Evolving Wilds in Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap and sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped. Then moving on to our utility lands, we'll be running Reliquary Tower as our only entry, which taps for a colorless and removes our maximum hand size limit, giving us yet another way to raise the amount of passive life gain the Archmandrite generates each turn, this time from the relative safety of our land slot. And lastly, we're running 9 plains, 9 islands, and 7 mountains as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 25 creatures including the Commander, 14 instants, 3 sorceries, 7 enchantments, 15 artifacts, 1 planeswalker, and 35 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 27 cards that either are or create tokens that are advisors, artificers, and or monks, 40 non-creature spells, 17 cards that care about non-creature spells, 19 sources of life gain, 5 cards that care about life gain, 10 cards that either have built-in or ways to grant evasion and or avoid combat damage, and 5 cards that remove our maximum hand size limit giving us plenty of tribe members for the Archmandrite to empower and to generate card advantage with, a pair of strong sub-themes in the form of non-creature spells and life gain to empower our tribe even further, a decent number of ways to overcome our tribe members' low toughness weakness by having them avoid or mitigate combat damage, and sprinkling in a handful of ways to ensure we can go beyond our usual 7-card hand limit to squeeze even more life gain out of our commander. For general deck stats, we have 12 ramp sources, 10 card draw sources, 13 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes, granting us a fairly typical spread of core stats with no real outliers. Then moving on to our mana curve, we have 8 1 drops, 19 2 drops, 15 3 drops, 12 4 drops, 6 5 drops, 4 6 drops, and 1 7 drop leaving us with a lower midweight curve that aims to get at least two of our tribe members down quickly, followed by the Archmandrite to begin building up our hand size with them and digging for more resources, allowing our creature's power to grow bigger and bigger each turn as both our hand size and life gain increase, until we're ready to bring down our opponents in one big and usually unavoidable attack. Currently, this deck is valued at $64.82, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can replace Skywise Teachings with Congregate if we favor a potentially huge amount of life gain to enable Alpha Strikes over gradually building up our board with tribe members. Soulfire Grandmaster can be replaced with Drum Bellower if we're willing to cut a tribe member for an additional way to untap our remaining tribe members each turn to generate additional card advantage. And Taigam Ojutai Master can be swapped out in favor of Ishai Ojutai Dragon Speaker if we want another evasive body that can quickly grow into a massive threat over generating additional value from our spells. Then for upgrades, Jeskai Charm can be exchanged for Heliod's Intervention to give us access to either excellent back row destruction or a potentially huge amount of life gain to power up our board. Urkel Master Wizard can be replaced with Lorraine of the Third Path to provide us with additional removal and a more reliable, albeit symmetrical, card draw effect. And Wizard Class can be cut in favor of Alhammerit's Archive to provide us with even more reliable card draw as well as doubling our life gain to empower our board even further. And lastly, Jeskai Elder can be retired in favor of Sarah Ascendant, which most of the time will be a 6-6 evasive lifelinker that only gets bigger alongside our commander, making it a very powerful addition to the build that will require a decent sized donation to the temple if we want this monk's assistance. Looks like he hasn't quite mastered ridding himself of earthly desires just yet. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I'd first like to thank each and every subscriber for helping the channel reach the 9k subscriber milestone. All of the support that you've given the channel has been truly amazing, so sincerely, thank you for helping the channel grow to this point and hopefully continue growing in the future. Then proceeding to the results of last week's poll, it looks like the Corrupting Influence precon was able to claim the top spot, so we'll be doing a precon upgrade for that build first, followed by Rebellion Rising the following week, so stay tuned for those. Now, since we already know which builds we'll be covering for the next few weeks, we'll be skipping our usual weekly poll. Instead, I'd like to hear from you. What commanders are you most excited about that have been spoiled so far for Phyrexia All Will Be One, and which ones do you want to see on the polls after we're done covering the precon upgrades? Let me know in the comments below so we can get those polls set up as soon as possible. 
And before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank Eric Bonderman for their generous donation, who asked me to shout out his niece and nephew, Quinn and Elliot. So thanks for the coffee, Quinn and Elliot, and tell your uncle thanks for helping support the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.